Hello and welcome to the Launch Notes podcast. I'm Blake from Launch Notes. Thrilled to be joined today by Jeff Ferguson. Typically, I read out a little bio here. I'm actually going to read directly from the email introduction I got for Jeff. Came from our mutual friend, another Blake. And this is just an incredible intro. So I'm just going to read this the way the way Blake sent it over to me. Jeff can close enterprise deals, play poker professionally, invest in incredible startups, founded his own Y Combinator startup. And recently, he also figured out he can run a global product marketing initiative for Confluent. He's a powerhouse and good friend who is probably not working at the moment because he's on the golf course. That is a heck of an intro. <laughs> I don't know if we'll be able to get into all that time today, but we'll sure try. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Awesome. Thanks, Blake. Good to be here. Let's start with poker. Like that, I mean, a hell of an intro. I, 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 I'm super excited to see how you, uh, some of the stuff you did to garner such a lights out intro but yeah let's start with poker like what's the deal there yeah okay so my story with poker is that you know I, I liked playing poker from the time i was a little kid you know i remember playing with my grandmother and my family around the house for for fun or for a dollar or something like that and i always liked the game i didn't really know why it turns out that it was because it was you know poker is a combination of logic probability and psychology it's very social and interactive and there's a risk reward dynamic and that just lends itself well to my personality. And so I played poker, just nothing serious until college. And when I was going to school in Santa Barbara, it was in the era of the sort of internet poker boom, party poker, ultimate bet, full tilt poker became really popular. And I got into poker when I was in college and I started by losing a lot of money. I was like, not very good at poker, but I really liked it. And I kept losing. And I, I had a friend who was going to school at Santa Barbara at the time, who was winning consistently. And so I asked him, you like, what, what are you doing that I'm not doing? And he said, well, you know, I, st I study the game systematically, you know, and he exposed me to a whole ecosystem of training videos and coaching forums and coaches and resources for learning and analyzing and studying the game, being much more data driven and tactical in my, in the approach to playing poker. And he basically taught me like how, he, how to become a winning poker player. And so I, I got really interested in those tools and started digesting that content using like hand tracking software that would create a heads up display where every time I would play a game, it would show me statistics about my, myself and my, and then I would do that and study and review hands to try to get better and better. And, you know, ultimately when I graduated from UC Santa Barbara, I decided to play poker professionally and I did that for four years. So I was an online sort of mid stakes heads up specialist, meaning I would just play one-on-one -on -one with other people almost exclusively. Um, and, you know, I was, I was consistently one of the top, top players of those stakes. And I made a pretty good living doing that for, for about four years until, you know, there was a, a day called Black Friday, which is a Black Tuesday, one of the days. Anyways, the banks cracked down on online gaming and the games dried up and I was kind of tired of doing it. I didn't see a long-term trajectory that I liked in poker. And I was living in San Francisco at the time, and that's when I pivoted into tech. Very cool. Very cool. I know it. it so it sounds like the, the big sort of lesson or the big sort of pivot in your, in your poker career and it, it kind of came at that moment when you decided to start actually, you know, not just playing, but intentionally learning, studying. Anything from those, you know, I know there were probably a lot of things. Any specific, like... Was there one little tip or one little trick or tactic or something that sticks with you as like, oh, like that one thing, like, you know, always stuck with me and then, and, and leveled up my poker abilities. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd say I'd have to answer that in, say it was a few things. Cause it's not just one thing. I mean, the, the first thing is that I learned in that process that anything can be done better if studied rigorously, like if studied and systematically approached from a mm -hmm. lens where you try to find the people who have come before us who are doing well at it, right? Because a lot of mm -hmm. times like other people have already figured this stuff out, whether it's poker or product marketing or anything, finding yeah. the ecosystems of people who have mastered the thing and taking a disciplined, studious approach to it is, is, the, is the optimal way to learn a new thing, I think. That's, that was one takeaway. The second mm -hmm. takeaway, has to do with understanding how other people think, right? Like when, when, once you learn the logic and strategy and the math, poker becomes a game of psychology. It's like, what do I think you think, right? 
And that's a useful skill, not just in poker, but in sales, in relationships and in life. Because one of the, mm-hmm. the main things I learned playing poker is that uh, other people have a tendency, well, people have a tendency to assume that other people think like we think, right? Like I just naturally yep. assume that you see the world the way I do. So when I talk to you, yep. my natural assumption as a human being is that you have the same set of assumptions and believe the same things I do. We don't even really think about it. I think as people, we just do this. And so in poker, right, it's very important for me to get out of my head and like set aside my assumptions and try to like understand Blake. Like how does Blake think? What does it mean when Blake mm. makes a big bet? What does it mean when Blake takes his time when he like does a certain thing? What does that mean to him? Mm-hmm. And it takes a certain amount of humility and a certain amount of empathy and a certain amount of emotional intelligence to do that, I think. And it's, it's really helpful in, in any type of social dynamic. Poker is just one example, but it actually applies to business, to sales, to intimate relationships, to everything, right? Because the more I can understand how you think, the more tactically I can craft a response to that, whatever my goal is. In poker, obviously, it's to make you do a certain thing or for me to do a certain thing. In relationships, it's, you know, it can be a variety of different things. In business, obviously, we're trying to, like, build great value so that's two right the second insight is that other people don't think the way that we think and we need to be mindful of that and then i'd say the the last big takeaway from poker is was learning to think in what's called expected value which i think you and probably a lot of people here will understand but it's it's basically like a mathematical term that describes the expected outcome of a probabilistic event over a large sample size right so if you flip a coin a million times expected value of heads and tails is, is even at 50, 50% each. If you're playing poker and you put all your money with pocket aces against pocket kings, the expected value of you winning, you know, it's like roughly like four to one. So in sales, right, where Blake and I met, how, that's how I got here, it, it's like sales can be thought of as expected value, right? I've got 100 accounts. Mm-hmm. I expect that I'm going to get conversations with 20 of them. Each of those conversations is going to turn into like, you know, 20% of those will turn into an opportunity. So then I'll have like four opportunities and I'll close, you know, one deal and the deal's worth half a million dollars. So my expected value of working a hundred accounts is half a million dollars in sales. And if I get mm-hmm. 500 accounts, it would be $2.5 million, right? And once I know mm-hmm. these numbers, I can sort of start at the end goal that I need and work backwards. If I need to close $10 million in revenue, given these assumptions, how many leads do I need? How many sales reps do I need? It's not rocket science, but learning to think in terms of expected value is really good in business because we're constantly dealing with imperfect information and probabilities. That's awesome. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing sort of set of set of tips there. I can already see, I mean, all the ways that that benefited, you know, certainly a career in sales. And I'm sure, you know, you could apply this to almost anything. It sounds like going into sales. I mean, was that, was that intentional? Did you see sales from your poker background as, Hey, this is going to be a great sort of forum for the the sort of skills and practice I've done already, or did it just sort of happen to work out? A little bit, yeah. I mean, I always kind of knew that sales was a place you could go and make a lot of money kind of quickly, and I always mm-hmm. thought of myself as the the personality type who might be good at it. You know, I'm an extrovert. Mm-hmm. I like interacting with people. I've got a pretty high risk tolerance. Like, I'm fairly confident. I'm not. It doesn't hurt my feelings too bad if you shut me down and tell me no, just move on. And uh, and I knew that I was analytical in my approach, right? Like we just talked about. So I kind of had this Mm -hmm. sense that like, you know, if I wanted to move into tech, like sales was somewhere I could probably get a job and work my way in. And then my, my results would be proportionate to my, you know, my capabilities really. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I kind of had a a sense for that. You know, some of it's just yeah. luck too, right? I was in San Francisco. I got plugged into a good tech company through some friends I knew, and I worked my mm-hmm. way up the ranks pretty quickly. So it turns out I was right about my assumptions. But you know, so a lot of it in life is just kind of the right place, right time. As much as we don't like to think so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. What were those? Uh, what kind of products were you were you working with and selling early on? Yeah, so the so the first the first sales job I took was at a company called Meraki, and it was a cloud networking company that was ultimately acquired by Cisco. But mm-hmm. what they essentially did is they took part of the like physical networking infrastructure stack and put it in the cloud, right? So okay, yeah. You know, what what people were doing with Cisco firewalls and routers and switches at the time was buying all this hardware, setting it up, using a command line interface to configure the network, and then operating it right, but from a CLI. And mm-hmm. what Meraki did is said like, 
we need to make this way simpler. We need to make this look like Google Maps. And so they took the controller and they put it in the cloud so that anybody who runs a university, a school, a local business, whatever, could log on to an interface that looked like Google Maps and manage their wireless network and set security controls and permissions and monitor everything without being very technical. And Mm -hmm. so that was a Mm -hmm. fairly easy product to sell. But what I was doing was just hammering the phones. I was doing 100 cold calls a day as an SDR, like entry-level sales job. And, you know, that's where I really cut my teeth in sales. Yeah, yeah, got it. That's just sort of like, I imagine sitting down at the table and I'm going to try to see as many hands as I can and just wait until the, you know, wait until the right moment shows up. Yeah, right. And so so that's that's an expected value calculation, right? It's like, how many calls do I make? What's my close right. rate per call? And the close rate in this case is getting a meeting. And then it's like, just multiply those together. The more calls you do and the higher your close rate is, the more meetings you get and then the more you get paid, right? Right. What was your, what was your transition then into like, into more of like a, an AE type role? And you know, when you start kind of closing deals. Sure. So, so I did that for four months and after sure. four months of that, I was at the top of the class, right? I was like our number one performing SDR at Meraki. And I mm-hmm. saw the sales reps that were working at Meraki. And I thought to myself, like, I could definitely do what they do. So I went and talked to the powers that be, they, they said, no, you know, we got to, you have to do this for a year. We have a program. It's kind of like you're in this fixed box. And I right. said, well, I'm not, I'm not going to do this for another eight months. Like I, I don't, I don't think that's my best opportunity. And they said, well, sorry, you know, this is our model. And I said, okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I had a friend, uh, my friend, Derek Nelson, who, who ended up being my co-founder later for the Y Combinator startup we did. He was working at an ad tech company in San Francisco called AdRoll. And mm-hmm. ad roll was in the ad retargeting space, you know, where you go to a website, you browse around and based on your browsing behavior, you might start seeing ads for that product. And yeah, definitely. Like if you put something in your, sh- your shopping cart and you leave the website, then you see a 15% off for that product. Like that, mm-hmm. we were t- a technology platform powering that for advertisers. And uh, so he recruited me there and they had just hired a VP of sales. I was building on a sales team, gave me a job. Blake Zokowski, who works at Launch Notes, was in my sales class. So we started together on the same day. And, uh, and that was my first closing role. And honestly, it wasn't, it wasn't any harder than what I was already doing. I actually liked it better because I was taking the sales process end to end. So I got to not only like generate my own leads, which I already knew how to do, but then, you know, I just talked to people and try to help them. And by helping them, I would close mm-hmm. deals naturally. So, yeah, yeah. Amazing. What, what was it like? Tell me a little bit about the ad space. I mean, maybe it's just the, the marketer in me, but I'm, I'm super interested in the digital ad space. And every time I talk to folks who have actually kind of worked in the trenches trenches at like an ad tech company. It's so fascinating because it's like these people know where the bodies are buried. What did, <laughs> what, what surprised you some, the most about working in that space? It's an interesting question. What surprised me the most about working in ad tech? Well, for one thing, like I was surprised just how much money is flying around in advertising. I got a sense for like for sure. what marketing budgets actually look like and how much money there is available and you know how differently people think about how to utilize that money. Yeah. Yeah. The other, the other thing that surprised me was how bad people are at analyzing the performance of their ad campaigns. Right? Like as a as a sales rep and an account manager for a display advertising product, I got the opportunity to talk to and work with probably a couple hundred different companies who were running ad campaigns and then we would take their budget. We would run ad campaigns. I would design them. And then we would talk about the results. And some of the advertisers on the other end of the phone were extremely sophisticated in terms of like analyzing the results of their campaigns, figuring out what's working, what's not working, how much of the result was incremental versus like cannibalizing other stuff. Uh, Mm -hmm. And some people would just like take what you told what the, what the dashboard said at face value, which I didn't, you know, always agree with. And so I was just, yeah. I was kind of surprised at the range of sophistication from people who were in charge of fairly large budgets. There were a lot of people who were in charge of very big budgets who didn't seem like they were very sophisticated. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I've definitely seen that. There's definitely a spectrum and your, your other point about just the, the sheer scale of, you know, talk about a total addressable market. Like there's a reason like some of the most monster companies we've seen the last couple of decades, Facebook, Google, our, our digital ad platforms, first and foremost, like that is such a gigantic TAM, right? And it's sort of like the first rule of startups, like 
go where there's a big TAM or like a growing TAM. And I, f I forget the stat. I wish I, I'd heard it somewhere before, but there's like a, there's some percentage of, you know, the United States GDP as ad spend. And it's some, you know, non, non-trivial number. It's like a single digit percentage of GDP pretty consistently over the decades. You know, this figure holds that, you know, whether recession, good times, bad times, there's always, you know, platform shifts, you know, from radio, TV, digital, there's always this sort of consistent chunk of just like the American economic machine, the global economic machine that is going into ad spend. And so, yeah, yeah. for companies like Facebook, Google, you know, the ones you were at, it's like, yeah, like if I can siphon some, some amount of that, um, it's, it's just a monster opportunity. It's a massive market. You're right. A lot of people don't, a lot of people don't realize that or think about it really. Yeah, I, I think that's correct. And I think, you know, the other side of that coin is that, you know, for each individual company, marketing itself is both a huge opportunity and a huge risk. Because mm -hmm. more so, I think, than any other department within a company, marketing has the potential to be at least like 10x worse and 10x more expensive per person yeah. than yeah. other divisions. You could take one person who has access to a million dollars in budget and just flush it down the drain. That's not really 100%. possible with a sales rep. You know, you're only at risk for their salary. Yeah. Uh, so there's that. Yeah, there's that old saying. I know half my advertising budget is wasted. I just don't know which half. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So given all that, I know you eventually ended up starting your own company. How did you know? How did this inform how you went about like marketing and you know any ad spend or? you know, advertising or kind of more broadly marketing and lead generation you were doing once you, you know, once you left, left that role and started your own company. Sure. Yeah. So I think just for context, I mean, after a couple of years of working at AdRoll, my buddy, Derek, who was a data engineer and I, who was a, you know, top performing sales rep at AdRoll, mm -hmm. uh, we decided that, we, you know, we didn't have that much equity at AdRoll and, you know, back to the expected value conversation, it's like, I want to try to get rich. I'm not going to get rich. Right. Sales rep, I can make a good salary, but I'm never going to make like real big money to make real big money. Mm -hmm. You got to have like ownership in something that grows rapidly in value. Okay. How do we do that? Well, we can have a lot of equity if we start our own company and then we have all of it. So, so mm -hmm. we applied to Y Combinator with an idea for a new data infrastructure product. It was like a real time database effectively. And mm -hmm. they funded us and we went through Y Combinator. We raised seed round. We hired a team to build the product. You know, b because of the type of product that we built, which was an open source or like, you know, free, free, basically free with the source code available for anyone not familiar with open source. Oh, uh, sure. It was an, it was an open source database product. So that the marketing strategy for a product like that is a little bit different than the marketing strategy for a pure play SaaS product, right? Mm -hmm. Things that are closed source, you got to get people aware of the product and trying it, right? And with open source, you kind of just like put the product out there and the, the open source product itself is the marketing vehicle, right? Yeah. Develops the community of developers, users, all that. Exactly. Yeah. I, I heard a guy, Eric Frankel, who was the CEO of MemSQL, another YC-backed database company at the time, say mm -hmm. one time we were talking about this, we're walking in San Francisco and he, he said something interesting that I always remembered. He said, Open source is not a business model. It's a marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. And I always yeah, thought that was interesting, right? That's a great insight. A hundred percent. Yeah. So, Real, so for yeah. us, to, to your question about marketing and ad spend, we didn't do a lot of paid advertising because for one thing, I, I'm not, I don't think that's a very effective strategy if you're targeting developers, especially low level systems developers. Like we're targeting, they just don't really like click on ads or respond to that. Right. I think the key is to use the product itself as a marketing strategy um, mm -hmm. and, and give them, yeah. give them some value with something they can get their hands on and tinker with and then produce yeah. helpful content that informs like facilitating that interaction. So we didn't do any paid advertising because it wasn't the right tool. So what I learned, yeah. is, I guess at AdRoll is like, this isn't going to work for developers and we need <laughs> to take a different approach. Yeah. I mean, I can't think of a, I can't think of a, any cohort with probably a higher percentage of folks with ad blockers installed than developers, right? No, yeah, they just yeah. don't respond to that. So, so yeah. the product is the marketing strategy. And, and by the way, like for, for anybody on the call who's in like product development or product marketing, I don't think that that's exclusive to open source. I think you take, you know, 
Mm -hmm. You take products with like pay as you go self service models. And the keys is just get people using the product, right? And then the product 100%. also is your marketing vehicle. And the goal is to drive people into that funnel. A hundred percent. The sort of land and expand, you know, I'd love to talk about though. I mean, it, it sounds great on paper, but you know, you and I both know that the, that strategy itself, like creating an open source product, building a community around it, getting that sort of bottoms up viral organic adoption, like it almost be easier to throw a massive ad budget at something, right? <laughs> like I can't imagine the cold start problem of building a whole community and ecosystem from scratch around this, this product that you guys had. How did you go about like jumpstarting that and what seemed to be most effective in terms of like building that early community and, and group of users? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think to answer that question, I have to go back even before we built the product, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think the truth with sales and marketing is that no amount of sales and marketing will make up for building the wrong product. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So... I think a lot of people have this idea that like what they're building is super important and the customers really want it. And I think a lot of times that's disconnected from what their users and customers actually think. Uh, I think this is especially true for, for developers who don't want to talk to people really. Um, mm. So they, they, they're very smart people who have good ideas and they kind of sit in a vacuum and they build something and then they take it to market. And I think that's actually mm. exactly the wrong approach. I think the key to building the right product is to start selling before you start building. And I don't mean actually selling, I just mean like talking to your potential customers. So the, the most important thing, and the thing that unlocks everything else is building the right product, which is informed by a very concerted effort before you ever write your first line of code to understand the market and talk to lots of customers or potential customers about their problems. And if you build this, would they really want it? If they want it, would they really pay you for it? If they pay you for it, how much would they pay you? Like what problems to solve and like have like a hundred or 200 of those conversations before you ever start building anything. Cause if you, cause if you don't do that and you build the wrong product, you know, you're screwed. You're dead in the water. No matter how much ad budget you have, no matter how much content you write, it won't matter. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. Yeah. That's the first thing. And it's like, I, it's, it's amazing to me how often people, people overlook that. I think it's cause they just don't want to do that hard work at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yep. They just want to build stuff, right? And I get it, but it's the wrong approach. Yeah. So, yeah. So with that said, assuming that like somebody is on the right track and building a product that people actually want and will pay for, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's hard to build an ecosystem. Like nobody wants to, you know, be the first one to use a new database. But that was one of the reasons we went open source. You know, we we built we built our V1.0. The, the company was called Pipeline DB. It was a streaming database, right? So. Mm -hmm. um, Instead of like traditional databases, you take a bunch of data generated by like, let's use ad campaigns. You serve a billion ads to a bunch of people. You store that in rows in a table in a database. And then when you want to know something about that data, you query the database and you get a result. Like how many ads did I serve yesterday? Uh, you write mm -hmm. a SQL query, query the database, you get a result. What we did mm -hmm. is we built sort of like an inverted database. And we said, what if you just, what if you just continuously analyzed all the data that's coming in in real time and you only stored the output of the data, right? So instead of like storing a trillion rows in a table and then counting them up later, what if you just counted them up one at a time as it arrived, like a bouncer at the door with a clicker counting people that come in one, two, mm. three, four, five, and you just store one row in the database and it's a summary row. So it's sort oh, of like an cool. inverted yeah. database that allows you to do continuous computation on the fly. Anyways, that was the product that we built. And we, we tried to sell that as a closed source product at first. I did this for months and I got basically nowhere. Um, mm -hmm. and it, and that was one of the reasons why we decided to make it open source. Cause like we knew it had value, but it was hard to get people to use it at scale because we were trying to sell it to them, you know, instead of just giving yeah. it to them. And then by making it open source, like developers like open source stuff. So we made yeah. it open source, we, yeah. we produce a bunch of content then we got a bunch of users and we could write about their use cases. And then slowly, but surely we took this, you know, mm -hmm. little, little spark and turned into a small flame and the flame got a little bigger and. I think that's yeah. kind of how it worked for us. Yeah, yeah. That's great advice. And I mean, gosh, I can't think of a I can't think of a harder kind of tops down battle to fight than, you know, hey, head of this massive engineering organization, like how'd you like to do like a 
you know, rip and replace some database. Like <laughs> what a task and yeah, what a massive ask, but it's, you know, it goes to show knowing your audience too. Like that's the thing with developers. Like they're going to have something they're tinkering with. They're going to have something they're tinkering with on the weekend. They're going to have stuff that they're, you know, doing for work. That's, you know, sort of smaller tools or projects or experiments they're running, like, and kind of getting that initial seed of activity, you know, with the individual, individual engineers, the, the ICs of the organization, then it can kind of bubble up from there. Yeah, that, that's right. And the other thing I think to point out here is that, you know, if, if our, if the product that we had built was solving a very well-known, clearly defined problem, it would have right. been easier to sell top down as a closed source product. Right. So yeah. if yeah. you have a closed source data, if you'll say you have a closed source database, and you go to somebody at Macy's and say, look, this will do exactly what your a database A is doing, but it will do it twice as fast at half the cost. They'd be right. like, cool, we'll evaluate that, right? Because like, right. that's it's clear what the value is. But right. what we were trying to do is to get somebody to do something different, to think differently. So you, it's hard to get somebody in the abstract to appreciate the value of doing something different when they can't even use it. It's like you're asking them mm-hmm. to take too much on faith. So I think for products where the where you're trying to get people to like think or act differently, mm-hmm. you kind of have to give them more earlier. Otherwise, yeah. they're, they're not, you're not going to get them hooked. The clearer the value proposition is, like if it's simpler, faster, cheaper, and that's obvious, then mm-hmm. you can make it close source and ask for more money up front. So there's sort of like an inverse relationship between how intuitive the value is and how early you can start asking things, asking yeah. people for things. So let me, let me ask, let me ask you this. Suppose you had, you had that same angle with a product where you're asking people to think differently, change their behavior, but it's not a developer tool. So you don't have this sort of open source ecosystem lever you can pull. Like, are are there ways to do this? I guess I'm asking outside of a dev tool, outside of an open source tactic. Yeah, I do. I I think, I think, you know, the, you want to get as close to that as possible, right? Like open source isn't really the key ingredient there. The the key ingredient there is that it's free and it's accessible and that people can get their hands on the product, right? So it's possible to make yeah. closed source products free and accessible and let people get their hands on the product. You just, mm-hmm. you just do it in a, as a self-service product. You say, you know, mm-hmm. we've got this new SaaS tool that will allow you to do X differently. Mm-hmm. Click here and you can try it. And click here and you can read stories of other customers that are doing it. And like, you can just mm-hmm. use it and here's our documentation and like, here's the value and here's your case studies and you know, why, why you find that interesting. And then you let people grow into the usage. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the less intuitive, the value is the more you have to give it to them in that way for free. And even for, for products where like the, the value is intuitive, I still think that's a great marketing and sales strategy just because it gets people in the funnel earlier and using the product. Anytime you can get people like get their hands on your product, that's great. So you should solve for that. Yeah. 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 No, great, great, great insight there. I want to get to, before we wrap up here, I want to get to, cause I know you've done a little product marketing work too. And I want to get yep. to that. So you guys, you did the Y Combinator thing, you were acquired and you eventually stepped into a product marketing role. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So we, we sold pipeline DB to a company called Confluent, which is the company behind Apache Kafka, which is like another data infrastructure product, very popular open source Apache product. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have a SaaS product and they have a, a commercial distribution. And so we, we sold it to them in 2019. I initially went to work in business development, actually running our global Google cloud Alliance, all the go to market activities for our partnership with Google cloud, take all the open source users of Kafka, mm-hmm. smash them, combine them with the people who are using Google cloud or want to, and then like go make that product partnership work. So I did that for two years until I decided that, you know, I wanted to do something different. And I moved into to product marketing. And the reason I moved into product marketing was one of Confluence goals at the time, which I think is, you know, at this the time of this recording, still one of their top priorities, was to go mm-hmm. from being a low-level data infrastructure product to moving up the stack, up the application stack, and starting to build and sell solutions, right? And that could be like additional products that you build. That could be, you know, just articulating patterns, like usage patterns for the product, or it could be via partnerships with other companies where you take product A and smash together with products B, C, and D, and then you get a full solution stack. 
And I wanted mm -hmm. to be on the forefront of doing the research and development and analysis and like informing the company's strategy to move up the stack from a data infrastructure company into something that solved, or at least articulated how to solve uh, more quantifiable business problems. Like, you know, it's mm -hmm. not like how fast is your database, but like how do you use your database to build a real time fraud detection algorithm that prevents credit card fraud for a visa? Mm -hmm. Or how mm -hmm. do you build like a real-time inventory system for targets so that they don't you know, have so much excess inventory can optimize their supply chain, stuff like that. Like actually specific use cases. That's how I got into it. Very cool. So I'm sure, I mean, in a lot of ways, like as a product marketer, your, your job is to sort of aid and assist the, the go to market motion, the sales cycle and provide the sales team with, you know, collateral resources, ammo to help them, you know, be more successful in their missions. So obviously the sales background is, is super helpful, is super helpful there. What, what maybe surprised you about that role or what did you, what did you not expect going into a product marketing role that, that gave you maybe some empathy for <laughs> maybe product marketers you've crossed paths with in the past? Sure. Yeah. There's, <laughs> I can think of a couple things. So one is that product marketing is a highly subjective field, right? In its essence, like product marketing sits at the intersection of engineering and the product teams, also sales, if you're working with finance operations, the executive team, you're really kind of at the center of a lot, whether if you're in product or you're in product marketing, you kind of like sit in a quarterback role across a bunch of different divisions of a company. And mm -hmm. I think you, you take, you take the complexity of that, all those intersections and all the people and their personalities and the interests they have combined with the fact that when you're talking about describing and articulating the value of a product, that's, that's pros, right? You're talking about language and like how to describe something. There are a lot of mm -hmm. different ways you can do that. So you take a highly subjective thing, like describing the value of a product and all the different people who have different opinions about how to do that. And what you get is a ton of complexity, like a lot of cooks in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. And so the, yeah. the thing that I didn't see coming that turned out to be a huge problem actually for me at Confluent was working in this highly subjective area with so many cooks in the kitchen it was like impossible to get things done effectively because there were too many people with too many opinions. N nobody could really agree on what we were solving for. And yet it was my job to solve for it. So I didn't really see that coming. You know, I hadn't worked in a large organization like that before. And, and that, that, that complexity made it really hard for me to effectively do what I was trying to do. There were just too many, yeah, too many cooks in the kitchen. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm smiling over here cause I know exactly what you're talking about. And, you know, especially when you get into things like positioning and messaging and like, Hey, we're going to articulate the value prop for this entire thing. And it's like, boy, did the opinion show up and it's yeah. like, you do enough of that. I can almost like, sometimes I can look at another company's website or a billboard or something and just like see the death by committee that happened with their positioning sometimes where it's like, boy, like this really got watered down or like someone, Someone lost a battle to the executive team on that one because it's 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 very challenging and yeah, like you said, like so much of it is is subjective and it's not proven out. Like you know, you can't really A B test your positioning to a degree. You can, but for the for the most part, you you kind of have to go to market with what you believe to be your best your best version and hope it works, right? I, yes. Although I would say with the caveat that I think there's a way to move from taking your best guess and hoping it works into actually like having a data driven strategy that you, mm. where you believe it's going to work. And it, again, to go back to the sales thing, it has to mm -hmm. do with like talking to your customers, talking to your users, right? Yeah. If yeah. I, if I work in a complex environment like Confluent, the problem is all this complexity, all these different people with their opinions and the subjective work we're doing, right? Mm -hmm. The solution to that problem is to go to the customers and talk to a hundred customers or potential customers and ask them like, what do you think this, pro what is this product to you? What's the value mm -hmm. of it? Why would yep. you use it? Why wouldn't you use it? What are you afraid of this and that? And then document that, find the patterns. That way, when you go back to this giant group of people who have this vested interest, you could say, look, this isn't my opinion. This is what mm -hmm. our customers are telling us. Our product is, but here's the benefit from it. Here's how they think about it. And we want to, take the sample size of a hundred 
and take the 30 people that said the same thing and broadcast that to the whole world and then know that it's probably going to resonate with 30% of our target audience. And that's the, the, that's the highest intersection. That's how we're going to hit the most people with the right message. And that's, that's mm -hmm. not something that I came up with, something that our customers told us. And it's really yeah. kind of hard for anybody to argue with that because like any executive or engineer yeah. gets that. They're like, okay, great. This is a math equation. You just took something subjective and turned it into a math equation. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. We it reminds me we recently had a, a one of these conversations with Matt Hodges. He was one of the first PMMs at Atlassian and Intercom and ran marketing at Loom for a little while and he was talking about, you know, kind of diving into this challenge and copy for the website positioning and his his suggestion which I thought was really on point was send a survey, ask the customers the question, what is how would you just basically how would you describe this product to a friend or colleague? And I think that's great. And sort of like asking, you know, whether you phrase it that way or some other way, like I think the point is getting customers to talk about it in their own words, seeing the language they use around it. And if you get enough of that feedback, eventually you'll see, you know, patterns, common language, common words, common phrases people use, ways they think about it. And that'll kind of inform like, okay, like there's something that's clicking here and we've, we've sort of keyed in on what that is. Right. Yeah. Or not. Right. Like sometimes it's a negative filter. And exactly. It doesn't work too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's hundred percent. You, you go back, go back to the poker thing, right? Like yeah. it doesn't matter what I think. Mm -hmm. It matters what our customers think. Right. Mm -hmm. so let's set aside Jeff's biases about like how cool this product is and how valuable I think it is and what I think the ROI is. And let's like get into the mind of the customer. Cause that's the only thing that really matters. And then from there we can understand how they think about it and play this poker game where like, I want to try to create, get them to do something that's in my interest, which is like use or buy our product. But I'm only going to do that if I can get out of my head and into their head. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I've got two super, uh, two quick ones. These are just kind of fun before we wrap up. What's a strong opinion you have that you think a lot of peers, you know, might disagree with? Just generally, like broadly in life or specific could, to this? Could be. I mean, could be, could be related to startups, you know, sales, marketing, or life in general. Your call. I'll keep it to kind of work stuff since this is sort of like work related. I think people are way too reasonable, you know? Mm. I, think, okay. I think people would benefit from being like way more unreasonable. Like people are just way too, way too like docile and they're too meek and they're too afraid and they're too kind of okay. like, oh, well, I just want to do the reasonable thing. And I think, I think most individuals would benefit by being like significantly more unreasonable and more willful. <laughs> that's what we call, that's a, that's what we call a hot take. You got to tell me more. Like <laughs> you got to tell me more about that. I think, I think it's like in terms of the business world, I think it's possible to like, kind of impose your will on the world, right? Like okay. I have this weird career path where I got into poker and people said I couldn't do that. And like, I forced it and I made it work. And then yeah. people were like, you don't know anything about databases and data infrastructure. Like, how are you going to do that? And I said, you know what? I'll find the smartest guy now. We'll just like, mm -hmm. we'll go make it happen. We got Y Combinator behind us. We raised a bunch of money. We hired smart people. We just like imposed our will on the world. And we made that happen. Sold mm -hmm. the company, you know, got, got into business development, pushed my way into product marketing, now I'm working on other stuff and it's, you know, it's not like anybody like handed me any of these things. It's, mm -hmm. I just like, I just choose a direction. I set a target and I just commit to that target no matter what. And like mm -hmm. when you do that and you take a relentless approach to things, it's amazing how you can like take the story that is the world and what's possible, what I can do, what I can't do and just bend it and break it and change it. And if you mm -hmm. really like, if you're really determined and committed to a certain outcome, like it's possible most of the time. And I think people tell themselves a story that it's not possible, that there are all these constraints. Oh, I got to get my manager's approval before I do this. And I'm going to blah, 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 whatever their story is. And it's just bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, no, that's great. I think that plays out in like big ways and small ways. I mean, you've got these kick-ass examples of, you know, starting companies and, you know, kickstarting a sales career and all that. But like, in my mind, like you could also do this on like smaller thing, you know, it could be a specific project or like a, you know, one slice of one initiative or something you're working on where it's like, and I hear this all the time where people are, you know, acting like the cosmos are against them. And I'm like, you're not, we're not trying to invent cold fusion here. Like just brute force it into existence. You know, it can, it can be done. And you know, and most things is, is great advice. All right. Last one. Also, also just kind of fun because you know, people who work on product are passionate about product. 
any products you're playing with lately? I know you're on, on leave right now, so you might not have any any B2B SaaS hot takes. Maybe it's a golf club. I don't know. But <laughs> any yeah, any products you're playing with lately that that you think are pretty cool? Have your attention. I haven't been using a lot of new software products. I've actually been sort of intentionally like turning my mind away from uh, mm-hmm. work and software and, and you know, money as much as I can get my brain to turn off about it and not focus on that. So I'm not totally up to speed on like, 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 like B2B tools and products. I will say this though, like one of the products, maybe my favorite product of all time that people don't really think about as a product as much as is Google search. You know, if you think about like what Google search is, it's like this magic box. You go to a web page, it's just one box. You go type in anything in the world you want to know, anything in the world you want to do, and then oh, just like magic, it appears. Mm-hmm. And this magic box that they created unlocked an infinite revenue stream of epic proportions for its builders. The dynamic auction-based business model where people pay huge sums of money to get their ad featured on their search results from this. And they don't have to talk to any customers. It's all automated. The price is dynamically created and positioned, and it's so simple and elegant on the front end. It's like really a beautiful product, right? So despite what anybody thinks about Google, like Google search is a believably well-built, successful mm-hmm. product. And so I think the the simplicity and the scalability and the value that it creates for users and then the value it unlocks for the business in turn, it probably makes it my favorite product of all time. Amazing. Yeah, really. I don't know if I've heard anyone so eloquently describe Google search before, but you nailed it. That was awesome. Right on. Uh, Jeff, this was super fun. If folks, you know, I don't know, maybe you don't want people to get in touch with you, but if, if folks are dying to get in touch with you and they listen to this whole thing, how might, how might they reach out? Yeah. I mean, you just email me. My email is Jeff at Fergie.com, F E R G I.com. Feel free to shoot me an email. Right on Jeff. Thanks for being here today. This was super fun. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Blake. Good to be here. I appreciate it. For sure.